Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetRootsRadio.com presents David Walker. Kegro in a morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, November 14th, 2018. Time for yet another show. These things keep coming and coming. Nothing we appear to be able to do to stop it. So we might as well play along at this point. And why not? All right. Uh, let's see. It is a Wednesday, and so that's a, that's, uh, a good sign, let's say, for an otherwise scattered set of stories. We can have our thoughts organized for us uh, a little later by Greg Dworkin and even later by Joan McCarter, who will be coming by. And uh, guess what? The Congress is actually back in session, desperately scrambling in its lame duck session. And uh, at the same time, newly elected members are making their way to Washington to uh, get schooled in how this thing works. And, uh, well, they'll do their best to learn it along the way. And we'll see how it goes. Leadership positions are up for grabs. People are jockeying. We can talk a little bit about that. Uh, what I've seen, what I think I've seen, what I think what I've seen means, what other people think it means. And uh, we'll uh, explore further opportunities to stab each other in the back over nothing for the sake of, well, also probably nothing. But, uh, you know, we love to do that as Democrats. We are always in disarray. Don't forget that. You should have learned that lesson by now. And, uh, well, plenty to, uh, plenty to cover today. I, I, my, uh, mind is immediately occupied by something I just happened to see go by on Twitter. Of course, that would be because it always happens and is always in the news. And someone I know is always talking about it. And so, therefore, we are aware of a very bad streak for, uh, armed security guards and school resource officers in the last couple of days. It's just happens to be the case, and it's probably almost always the case, but there's been sort of three rather spectacular incidents over the last, well, actually, as it happens over the last three days. Uh, it came to my attention when Shannon Watts, and you know Shannon Watts of uh, Mom's Demand and uh, Every Town for Gun Safety, uh, has uh, picked up the mantle in many ways of uh, tweeting around some of the more egregious gun stories out there. This one, you know, actually relatively routine. It doesn't happen an awful lot in exactly this way. But, of course, stray bullets, the ones that uh, up and leave the guns on their own volition. Uh, you know how we, how we uh, discuss these things, stray bullets, uh, has uh, found its way to enter the leg without permission of a young six-year-old girl in Texas, probably her fault for supporting the caravan or something like that. But she was at McDonald's with her family uh, in a uh, the drive-thru. They actually didn't even bother entering the McDonald's. Uh, she was hit by a, what we call a stray bullet, fired by a security guard who was shooting to stop someone from stealing a cell phone, which is, of course... Not one of the reasons why an armed security guard or an armed civilian or police officer or anyone should be shooting. And uh, you know how it is with bullets. Once you let them go from the gun, they have a mind of their own. They travel more or less a straight path, though they sometimes ricochet. And responsible gun owners are responsible for watching what might be in the line of their target and what might be beyond their target. That's all Part of what you're supposed to take into a calculation to fire the weapon. That's why training is often necessary. But, you know, the Second Amendment being what it is, people have rights. And uh, part of your right is to let those bullets go wherever you want. And, uh, you know, if you were trying to do good, that's basically enough. Uh, I'm not sure what the minimum amount of good is. Trying to stop a, a cell phone theft, I mean, that's a good thing. We don't necessarily need a gun for that, Right. Uh, we might lower the threshold a little bit. For instance, if someone you know was, uh, let's say, interested in a cup of fresh-squeezed orange juice, it wouldn't necessarily be beyond the pale to fire a weapon 
add an orange in an attempt to release that juice. Just so long as you had good intentions along the way, I think should probably be enough. And so obviously we can excuse, obviously we can't, excuse a McDonald's security guard. Why is that even necessary? For stopping somebody from, well, he didn't. I don't know whether he did stop the cell phone theft or not. But firing a weapon, of course, you know, at best you kill a cell phone thief. I don't think anybody really needed that to happen. At worst, you miss and you shoot a six-year-old girl in the leg. She's okay. That's the... The upbeat part of the story, everybody should be happy. She's taken her first steps. She's six. Of course, it's not her first steps. It's just her first steps since an uh, armed McDonald's security guard thought that maybe someone else's cell phone was worth her leg or more. But anyway, I digress. As I said, this happened on Tuesday, and she uh, managed – or her first step after being shot on Monday happened on Tuesday. But it comes in the wake of a – Armed school resource officer in a high school in Maryland, I believe up in the Baltimore area, uh, deciding to take his own life, which ordinarily you might think is his own business. But of course, he brought his gun with him to school as part of the uh, as part of the job. But he decided that killing himself was necessary. And uh, maybe we don't question that decision. Deciding to kill yourself in the school you've been assigned to protect with that weapon, maybe not a great decision. And, uh, of course, we know that over the weekend, a security guard working at a bar was uh, uh, in, in the right place at the right time, I guess, and actually stopped a shooting in progress or uh, one that was uh, uh, threatened to break out immediately or at least worsen, actually apprehended the suspect, had him outside disarmed and was detaining him. Police arrived on the scene and, as no one has ever predicted, Police arriving on the scene at a reported shooting found a man with a gun on top of someone else and shot him and killed him. So, you know, he was here doing the right thing. It's been it's just been a great run, a great three days for armed security guards, the armed security guard, guard option in America. I thought initially, as you know, because I believe everything the NRA tells me, that this was going to solve our gun problem. And as it turns out, we have instead three shootings, two deaths out of the three shootings, because that's kind of what guns are about. They're supposed to kill you when they hit you. But uh, uh, three three ridiculous situations in which I'm just I'm shocked. I don't know how else to put it, but armed security did not solve the problem in these situations uh, or even the one in the one situation where it actually solved the problem. Another good guy with a gun came and undid the solving of the problem. So fantastic. It's been a great run. Just thought I'd bring you up to date on that. As it happens, larger issues also swirling elsewhere, many of which don't even involve death or maiming, though you never know when uh, that might decide to become a part of our Washington DC scene as well. But anyway, Let's round up the other stories. Greg Dworkin is here. It's been a big week also for guns and doctors, and uh, he's a doctor, and we just talked about guns. So we're on topic. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. You are. And and we were part of that. Uh, this is my lane uh, piece there. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, I, I tweeted my piece of it, but, uh, yeah. you know, 15, oh, I don't know how many thousands, thousands of doctors have signed a petition uh, you know, uh, and uh, lots of news outlets are curry, uh, covering that story even a week later. So I think, well, that's great. What I'm going to focus on today, I don't have that much time. I got to leave at 930. Oh, I'm sorry. I would have is, gotten um, out of your way. I would have gotten out of your lane. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's all my lane. It's a super high. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the election. Oh, all right. That happened uh, also a few days ago. Going And on it's still eight. happening. Oh, yes, that's true. Right, we got um, both. Right. There are three-point kicks being attempted in the the ball that you kick with the foot game. So says Marco Rubio or some uh -huh. nonsense that nobody really understands. And then he quotes a Bible <laughs> verse and everybody else, you know, oh, quotes it was the Bible. Bible right back at him. Like, you know. Okay. I didn't uh, realize there were field goals in the Bible. Or 21, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. So um, – uh, Dave Weigel had this great tweet in February of 2017 that people have uh, have found. Yeah, that was awesome. It says, honestly, the funniest 2018 result. Remember, this is February 2017. Oh, 
Yes. The funniest 2018 result would be Democrats win the majority based on the suburbs after reporters spend two years canvassing rural diners. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's funny. It is funny. Because it's Because, true. like, it's true. Huh. What do you know? Uh, so our, I assume this means a bunch of suburb stories. That's good. No, no, no. You got to go back to the diners and oh. ask them what they think of the suburbs. Yeah, what happened? Where were you? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. They were all in the diners. And then report back on what kind of hat they're wearing, because that's, like, really important. Yes, right. So uh, we'll talk about the election that was, but let's just uh, mention quickly a little update about what's happening as far as we can tell. All right. Uh, with really the know. elections that are happening now. Georgia. This is Greg uh, uh, Bluestein and Mark Nisi from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Greg mm -hmm. Bluestein is my follow to figure out what's going on in Georgia. Okay. Abrams, that's Stacey Abrams, uh, governor uh, candidate on the Democratic side, running yes. against Brian Kemp on the Republican side. Ooh. Abrams gains ground as judges order more Georgia votes to be counted. Oh, votes. Yep. They filled with post-election drama. Final vote counts are still two days away, at least. And Democrat Stacey Abrams needs to gain more than 17,000 votes to force a runoff in the race for governor against Republican Brian Kemp. She doesn't need to win. She just needs oh. to get close enough for it to be a runoff. Oh, yes. But 17,000, that seems... That's a lot of votes, like so I lot. don't know that she gets there. Meanwhile, the contest for the 7th Congressional District was closer than ever. That's Georgia 7. Not yes. Georgia 6 without Ossoff, which we won, but Georgia 7, with Democrat Carolyn Bordeaux trailing Republican Rob Woodall by 500 votes. 500. That margin could narrow further because hundreds of votes in Gwinnett County are still pending. And the federal courts are the wild cards in both races. Hmm. Well, all right. Okay, Pending. so we don't know how many more additional ballots there are to be counted. I will remind people that when you think back to 2000 and the uh, race for president that involved a bit of a Florida recount. Uh, that was a big race, yes. It was, but it was a relatively <laughs> close number. Right. You know, 500s. And it's not like recounts automatically win. Most of the times they don't. So when you're talking about thousands yeah. of ballots, it's not usual that things change, unless you're California. Because uh, in California, happen, we're not yeah. talking about recounting. We're talking about late counts. And as those numbers come in, a funny thing happens, and that is – that the uh, Democrats basically just keep winning. Okay, we've already won thirty, uh, flipped thirty-three seats. We've gained thirty-three seats. Yay! Yes. California forty-five, which is uh, Katie Porter. She's overtaken Mimi Walters, and is leading by a couple of hundred votes. Um, New Jersey three. That's uh, not been called yet. Andy Kim over Tom MacArthur, the Republican. Mm. Uh, New York 22, that's uh, Brindisi, the Democrat, over Claudia Tenney. And Utah 4, Mia Love is the uh, Republican. Those four, uh, the Democrats are leading. They just haven't been called yet. Okay. But that uh, California 45 uh, with Mimi Walters, the Republican trailing, is important, Katie Porter winning, because, again, it's another one of those Southern California uh, wipeout wow. results for the Republicans. They're just getting clobbered. In well, fact, the other two that would if we win all and we're we're, tr or we're uh, leading in those if we win all of those, that brings us up to thirty-seven. Yeah, that's math. Then uh, we have California thirty-nine with Young Kim leading Gil Cisneros by like seven hundred and eleven votes. Oh. That was a couple of thousand, a couple of days ago, and as that comes in, Cisneros may win that one too, Great. and that's yet another uh, Southern California. Republican that might lose. And then Maine, too, we're waiting on the uh, uh, runoff voting count, which isn't going to happen until the end of the week, except Bruce Poliquin, the Republican, is suing to try oh, and I stop see. it, even though Maine voted to do it that way. Yes. That bring us up to 39. And then with that 500 vote difference in Georgia 7, that would actually make 40. Ta-da! And then it's a wave. Hooray! After that, <laughs> uh, th there's another couple that are still out there. Oh. But uh, unlikely to change. There's New York 27 with Chris Collins winning by about 3,000 votes, but still hasn't been called. And Texas 23 with Will Hurd 
uh, winning by about a thousand votes, and that mm. hasn't been called. So when you put it all together, it looks like the Democrats are going to win 37 seats or flip them. They may gain as many as 39 in a perfect world if we win all the close ones, 42. It's a wave. Yes. And people are uh, in, in the media coming around to it uh, a little slower than than we did. But just saying, you know, there's not necessarily waves don't have to be one giant tidal wave. The water gets there. The water gets there. You're still wet. I don't yeah, care how and it as we there. said the other day, you know, we, we, we've been saying this for a month before the election, a wave happens when you win more than your share of the close ones. Yes. And that's, in fact, exactly what happened. We won all oh, the ones we were supposed to. We poached three from the ones they were supposed to, including New York 11, Staten Island, where Dan Donovan lost, and the South Carolina seat where Katie Arrington lost. That was Mark Sanford's seat, and then we stole one in the middle of Oklahoma. So we won three from them. They won none from us. And then when you get to the toss-ups, we won like 19, maybe 20, and they won 10. You know, So we, we won like uh, two out of three of the close-ups, uh, the close toss-ups, rather yeah. than uh, splitting it evenly. That's exactly what happens in a wave. Hmm. And you don't see it because all of these races are close, and so they take days to count. Yeah. And then you see it, and you go, oh, my gosh, they sure l lost a lot of seats, didn't they? Yes. Uh, well, that, that I guess people will finally come around to that. It's, it doesn't mean, as we've said a million times, that everybody gets crushed and the counting is over in seconds. But uh, one day next year, people will be seated and they'll give you one of those handy red-blue charts of the house. And you'll say, oh, look at that. It's blue. Oh, how do you like that? Hmm. Okay, so uh, another thing that we have now is the Fox News voter analysis, which is to oh, say wow. the AP – and Fox News purchased their own exit polls, different than the CNN traditional exit polls oh. that you used to seeing. It's a different consortium, slightly different numbers. It looks to be a little bit more accurate. Some really, really interesting stuff that's in there. Okay. It's interesting that they have their own consortium. They weren't happy with the results last time. So okay. U.S. all-voter analysis, you can look state by state if you wish. We can check Virginia if you want. But I'm looking at the U.S. as a whole because that's really reflecting the House races. Republicans look at the U.S. as a whole, too. Uh, uh, so uh, women were 51 percent of the voters and men 49. The way it broke down is men voted for Republicans 50 to 45. Women voted for Democrats 55 to 40. So oh. that's a 20 point uh, uh, gender gap. And what you'll find in all of this is that the uh, pre-election polls are actually pretty accurate. But there's some really fascinating stuff in here. For example, the age categories. Age. Yes. All right. 18 to 29-year-olds, they were 12% of the electorate. They voted for Democrats 59 to 33. And the 30 to 44-year-olds, who were 23% of the electorate, voted for Democrats 55 to 40. So everybody under 45 voted for Democrat. Okay. Well done. Older. That's me. Okay. If you're older, it I'm wasn't old. dramatically for Republicans. Perhaps the most interesting cohort here is the 45 to 64-year-olds. Okay. The kids that grew up with Reagan, okay. Ronald Reagan. Oh, Donald Reagan. Yeah, Donald Reagan and Ronald Reagan uh, as president. And uh, they tend to be more conservative than any of the other cohorts. And they voted for Republicans 48-47, which isn't that much. That's but they're also the biggest close. group at 38% of the electorate. Hmm. Oh, well, yes, but, okay. But split. Well, That's not a good result for Republicans. Republicans yeah. have to win there if they want to win elections. And then the 65 and overs, 27% uh, of the electorate, they voted for Republicans 50 to 46. Again, not overwhelming. Uh -huh. So it turned out that the over 65s, which I think in the last election in 2016 were more like double digits Republican, only voted for Republicans by four points. So Democrats made a lot of gains in all of these age groups, and that's how they wound up winning the election overall. Hmm. All right. Uh, other things that I thought were particularly of interest, of course, we've talked forever about the difference between no college degree and college degree. Yes. Surprisingly, in this election, no college degree, which was 58 percent of the population, and it dominates in states like Ohio and uh, other places that tend to be a little more red than you would like to see. But no college degree, 58 percent of the electorate voted Democrat, 48, 46 
Well, that's a nice change of pace. Yeah, with college degree, fifty three forty three for Democrats. Okay. Well, people so, are learning so outside of college. Democrats uh, made gains everywhere, and if you want to know why, of course, the answer is Donald Trump. Oh, well, yeah, he's, okay, he's so terrific. Here, here is, in, in many ways, the key number uh, that people don't talk about enough. White evangelical, white born-again Christians are 22% of the electorate, but they voted Republican 77 to 17. Hmm. Everybody else, 78% of the electorate, but they voted Democrat 56 to 38. White evangelical and born-again Christians is Trump's base. Yeah, and they're able to keep things relatively close. Uh, in their group, you're not going to convince anybody. They have to be outvoted. But a reminder, they're only 22% of the population and probably shrinking. Hmm. Okay. Well, was so. Trump a reason for the vote? Trump was a factor 63. Trump was not a factor 36. Really? If you thought he was a factor, 57% Democrat and 40% Republican. If you thought he wasn't a factor, Democrats 38, Republicans 52. Huh. So you're voting on the economy or other things. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Sure. Of course. But uh, two-thirds said that you know he was a factor and they voted against him. Hmm. Huh. Okay, well, among normal people, is or hmm? yeah. voted to express support for Trump twenty six, voted to express opposition for Trump thirty seven. Trump was not a factor thirty six, and uh, the opinion of him, well, uh, very or somewhat favorable forty four, very or somewhat unfavorable unfavorable fifty three. That, that pretty much matches the polls, and job approval forty five yes, fifty five no. That's all, you know, fairly straightforward, but again, matches the polls. What the polls are telling you is actually how people voted. And interestingly, if you ask about yeah. how do you think about Trump on certain issues, they like him on the economy, hate him on health care, and on immigration, 45% approve and 54% disapprove. Mm, okay. Okay. 50-50 pretty much on Supreme Court nominations, 49-49 in border security, this wasn't necessarily a winner for him. Trump is the right temperament, 3564, no. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump is a strong leader, yes, 48, no, 51. That's not the number he wanted to see. Honest and trustworthy, uh, 36, yes, 62, no. That pretty much says it all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not clear that any of this nonsense that he did – with uh, immigration really helped him all that much. Uh, I mean, he's in, in most cases, if he's above water at all, he's only barely above water. And there, I mean, the, the star turns that he was supposed to take with the electorate are at best a 50-50 a, a split. That's, uh, yeah, that's no way to hold together a coalition. Good. But here's, but here's another way of looking at it. Oh. You may recall mm -hmm. that um, uh, Trump tried to make a deal out of uh, what was going on with immigration and the border yes. and all of that. Right. Right. I do recall so, this. So uh, let's ask the and the more the, the closer we got to the election, the more intense he was about it. Right. Okay. Does that sound fair? Uh, yes. So let's look at what best describes when you decided how you would vote. All right. You'd think if all the immigration uh, political stunts of sending troops to the border uh, and uh, immigration, 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 constant, uh, you know, rally stuff on TV, as well as the scary commercials. Remember the, remember the scary commercials? Uh, if all of that mattered, you'd think oh. that you would convince right. voters to vote for you as the election got closer. That would be, yeah, that would be your bet. That would be your bet, right? Yeah. So, which best describes when you decided how you would vote? Okay. Well, 47% said, I've known all along. All right, that's a lot. Dem Democrat 52, Republicans 45. So, uh, Democrats won the, I've been mad since you've been elected Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was the biggest cohort. Okay. I decided over the course of the campaign. That was 40%. 
Right there, you got 87% of the population. Okay. And they went Democrat 49-46. Mm-hmm. Okay. I decided in the last few days. Yes, that. Okay. 7% of them? 49 Democrat, 41 Republican. Hmm. The last few days, late-breaking voters went Democrat, which is not surprising. You often wind up voting against the incumbent if you haven't made up your mind by now. I see. Yes. But that's what happened. It's not that Trump convinced all those people to finally come across and, and uh, go with him. He did not. He may have repelled them. He may have made no difference. It's hard to tell with these numbers. But mm-hmm. there's nothing in here that says that Trump's immigration stunt worked. And then, of course, there's my favorite. Oh, something better? Yeah. 5% right. of the population say at the time that they were leaving the polls. Ah, uh, 5% said I still haven't decided. Leaving? When they were leaving the polls? <laughs> I already voted, but I still haven't decided. <laughs> I can see why that's your favorite. Okay. Or maybe they haven't decided as they were walking. I don't know if it's they did it on the way in or on the way up. 60%. You know, okay. It's, it's well, fun. yeah. I don't so know. if it could be an entry in poll. Public, I don't know. I hope so because <laughs> otherwise, like, you know, for the follow up question. We know the first nine letters of the alphabet, so I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll vote for whoever starts with one of those letters because I don't recognize the other. And I might not even do that. 60%. By the way, they voted Democratic 36 <laughs> I hope so. I'll, I'll take it, I guess. But I mean. But if the Democrats you, won every one of those cohorts, all kidding aside. That is, that's good news. Even even the cohort that doesn't know that they were voting. 60% of that cohort wasn't even sure they were there at the time they were answering the question. Right. Wow. That's, well, uh, this, this is one of those statistical things. I mean, we're always fascinated in these polarizing elections yeah. by people who there's have. There's gun stuff, there's union stuff, know. there's veteran stuff. There's a whole bunch of stuff for you to hmm. look at. But I'm going to leave you with that. Okay. And then uh, I'll be back tomorrow and we'll do oh. some more. Well, all right. That will be okay. Okay, then I'll let you go. Thanks for joining us. We'll take a quick break and uh, I will be back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. What do you say we continue with this? Uh, oh, look at that. I'll have to uh, check that one out. An interesting story we'll put aside for later. But uh, Greg had to make his way over to his lane, I guess, for the day's work. So uh, we'll look forward to his joining us tomorrow. In the meantime, lots to catch up with. And he dropped us a couple other articles that we will want to take a look at. And uh, let's catch up with some commentary from uh, around around the world, as a matter of fact. Uh, but a couple of comments on the opening of the show. And uh, let's see. Hmm. Oh, uh, all right. Well, uh, a couple of recommendations for stories. We'll take a look at that. Karen. Uh, Karen D. has this one for us. Honestly, uh, what I don't get about the Baltimore resource officer suicide is the total lack of alarm that he killed himself at his school during school hours. I'm alarmed by it. You're alarmed by it. But, and, and a lot of people are. But, uh, yeah, you're right. What uh, has come through is I'll just modify the comment uh, on the air because I, I don't know, because that seems like the wrong thing to do and I'm tempted to do the wrong thing at all times. But, yeah, I think what came through in coverage that we saw and commentary on the coverage we saw is just as you describe it. Lots of condolence messages to his family, but little on what the man exposed children to. And I think it's just a matter of it's beyond comprehension in a way. And, uh, and we're just not sure really how to, how to deal with it. And uh, everyone I think would be a, a large portion of the reading public would be upset with a commentator who used their media platform to note that 
at this point, this is one of those things that people would say too soon, too soon to, and, and, uh, because it involves a, a suicide in which no one else was physically harmed. It's an easy call for most people to say, well, let's just focus on this thing. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's outrageous what happened here. And it's exactly the sort of thing that if you've given a moment's thought to the possible downside of well, if you whether armed school resource officers, which in the main, I don't object to. It worries me because there's problems with it and, and problems are on the record with it. And yeah, problems with discharges of weapons in school, purposeful or otherwise. Uh, and it's always sort of been part of the uh, background dark contemplation, though, uh, especially when you're talking about arming teachers in addition to or instead of armed school resource officers. And you realize teachers, like any other cohort, have their troubled uh, people among them. And you worry about uh, someone carrying a domestic dispute with them into the school or their depression with them into the school along with a gun, whether theirs or someone else's that they manage to gain control of, uh, you worry about these things. And and here it happened. And, uh, you know, America, well, you know, I mean, that's a troubling thing, not just that it happened, but rather that uh, it's troubling in its own right that, America is not really ready to deal with this, even though it was entirely foreseeable. And, you know, it, it, it remains, oh, my goodness, beyond our comprehension and who can explain and what a horrible thing. But at least the kids weren't hurt, et cetera. Uh, we don't really know how to deal with it. And that's just another I don't know what else to say about it. It's, it's another sign that we were never ready really to accept the consequences of putting guns in schools, even in the hands of supposedly responsible, trained and and ready school resource officers. Every group has its people with issues in it. And, you know, school resource officers, I guess, no different than others in that sense. But you'd, th you'd think there'd be fewer of them. And there are. I mean, it's a, this is the first school resource officer suicide in school, I believe, that I've seen. But, uh, you know, we haven't been watching for all that long. We haven't been doing this for all that long. So, I don't know. It's uh, uh, it, it's pretty insane out there. And uh, even as I'm talking, I'm just seeing a number of other crazy issues, gun issues, and others uh, bubbling up because, of course, we're awash in gun violence. These, have story, these stories have nothing to do with what I'm talking about other than it, it's just uh, if you talk long enough uh, on the radio or elsewhere uh, in, in a place where others can come in and make comments on what's happening in the news, uh, five people will come by with terrible gun stories. Uh, as, let's see, I'm looking here at an NPR story. 26-year-old man has pleaded guilty to 51 charges after he made multiple phone calls falsely reporting crimes late last year, resulting in police fatally shooting an unarmed man. In other words, a swatting death is what we're talking about there. It's just another, it's symp symptomatic of, of gun mania in the country, even though it doesn't fit squarely into our traditional gun fail area, I guess. Um, also, I mean, I don't know whether a gun was absolutely involved in this one, but I'll bet it is because it is the story of a double murder in New Hampshire, and they are so infrequently perpetrated with swimming pools or, or uh, uh, baseball bats, but can happen. But here, looking at uh, Jeet here's interesting tweet about a Washington Post story that's really supposed to be more about technology than anything else. Police think Alexa, the Amazon Alexa automated assistant thing, may have witnessed, I guess you should put that in quotes, a New Hampshire double slaying. Now they want Amazon to turn her over. That's an interesting policing issue and Fourth Amendment issue and all, you know, all sorts of things wrapped up in this one. But, uh, oh, look at that. How do you like that? It's not even a gun story. It was the, someone who was stabbed to death. Two people, I guess, stabbed to death. That's uh, 
not unusual, but uh, it was unexpected. But it's an interesting story, nonetheless, uh, from the Alexa perspective. Uh, just quickly, interesting. I mean, if you want to take a look and analyze the story yourselves, uh, like I said, here in the Washington Post, amazing that the Washington Post would be so closely covering an Amazon story. Megan Flynn is the writer on this one. Alexa might have been listening, as she almost always is, when Christine Sullivan was stabbed to death in the kitchen of the Farmington, New Hampshire home where she lived with her boyfriend on January 27th, 2017. But does Alexa remember any of it? That's the question state prosecutors are hoping will produce key evidence in the murder against a murder case against Timothy Verrill, who was accused of killing Sullivan and her friend Jenna Pellegrini over suspicions they were informing police about an alleged drug operation. Prosecutors say Alexa, the artificial woman, that's an even interesting way of putting things, who personifies the Amazon Echo smart device, was sitting on the kitchen counter the entire time. What a weird way of putting it. Now a judge has ordered Amazon to turn over any recordings the Echo device may have made from January 27th, the day the woman, women were killed, until... January 29th, when police discovered them tucked beneath a tarp under the porch. Wow, uh, that is pretty interesting. And uh, I mean, is is Amazon resisting it? I guess they must be. But why? Let's see. Verrill's case marks at least the second time Amazon has become entangled in a high stakes murder case in which its device, a task manager activated on voice command, morphs into a de facto witness for the prosecution. Amazon's founder, by the way, Jeffrey P. Bezos, owns the Washington Post, in case you didn't know. In a statement to the Post, an Amazon spokesman indicated Amazon wouldn't be turning over the data so easily, appearing to prioritize consumer privacy as it has done in the past. I guess it's not final that they won't comply, or at least they want to be compelled to comply so that they can maintain that this isn't something that they're turning over voluntarily all the time. And I, I think that's probably, that's fine. That's an understandable stance. It's just a, uh, it's an odd circumstance. And uh, boy, when you invent these things, did you really think that you were going to be uh, involved in all of that? I mean, we know, for instance, from reading about uh, the v development of Facebook and the development of Twitter, I don't think any of the inventors, if there is a single inventor uh, for either of them, really gave much thought to the possibility that they might say, for instance, sway elections around the world or become the vehicle for interference from foreign agents in other countries' elections. I don't think they envisioned that, and I don't think that the developers of Alexa said, well, you know, it's good to have this thing around because in addition to being able to order groceries or find out what the temperature is, it may be an automated witness to your murder and uh, vindicate you from, uh, you know, from beyond the grave or, 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 or bring your murderer to justice. I don't know. You think that would be a, an advertising bullet point they could put on the box? You know, <laughs> that'd be rather depressing. But, you know, it appears to be happening. Got to pay some attention to it. All right. Lots of other things that we could probably discuss, including the things Greg left behind for us. Uh, a new raft of stories. Do I have this one in pocket as well? It's so hard to tell what I do and don't have. Yes, I do. Okay. So there are several uh, rather interesting and in many cases excellent compilations of uh, or, or analyses of how horrible Donald Trump is. And I know that's a regular feature of the show. This one is particularly, I think, spectacular. Greg put it in the roundup. I have it in pocket and uh let's see my recollection is <clears throat> that it was yes uh here it is uh, here's my first reference to it from lisa ianucci who uh follows the show regularly and sent this piece along uh from david roth not david lee roth of van halen fame but uh, david j roth of twit Twitter fame. I don't know. Is he famous? Uh, well, he's written a great piece, so he ought to be. And it is here at Deadspin's The Concourse. And it's entitled, This is All Donald Trump Has Left. And 
I'd say he pretty much nails it, so let's let's just share it. President Donald Trump often stands near a helicopter. I, I'll say this before I even begin on this thing. I read it. So this is one of the rare instances in which I've read the piece before I'm presenting it to you. And I would say the whole thing is is fun and great and true, but I think the first paragraph really just nails it so well. The rest of the things, I mean, there's, I would say, okay, I'll agree with about 90% of that. This one is really on the money. President Donald Trump often stands near a helicopter on the White House's South Lawn while reporters shout questions at him. It's definitely true. Certain elements of this ritual are the same every time. The wheedling honk of Trump's voice, and he does great with the vocabulary in this one. The wheedling honk of Trump's voice and the uneasy tilt of his standing on a hoverboard for the first time posture are constants, and I keep noting that. I'm amazed that he doesn't just topple over forward. Uh, as is his customary air of triumphal huffiness. So think about that as a sentence. So we've got a wheedling honk, uneasy tilt, standing on a hoverboard for the first time, posture, customary air of triumphal huffiness. The whining white noise washed from the helicopter bends everything in the same strange direction. With everyone involved, only kind of getting maybe three quarters of what everyone else is saying. And this part really hits it on the head, I thought. The questions change, and the answers mostly don't. It's never a conversation, although it unfolds roughly along those lines. And I think that that sentence holds so much in it. Not only is it an accurate description of what's going on, but it hints at Part of the difficulty that we keep harping on that the the media seems to have in figuring out how to deal with this guy, every outward sign that this is a presidency, every outward sign that this is a serious beat to be covering and should be considered the top job in journalism. And, and, and this is a guy appears to be the president. And uh, by tradition, the things presidents say matter but all of the reasons that things presidents say matter are gone or almost all of them except for the one which is he can still make people do things apparently so that's concerning but yeah i mean this this describes so much about what's wrong with their relationship with him it's so much about what's wrong with the way they present their information on television and how easy it is to impersonate news you know, to, to approximate the presentation of news, is what's, which is what's happening at, at Fox News Channel. They just, like I, I keep saying, I keep breaking it down to, well, they put them in suits and they put them on behind a desk and give them papers and put a little square thingy of a, a picture of the relevant story up behind them. Or uh, for morning chat, they sit them on a couch. And again, they're in suits. The women are in skirts and dresses. They're makeup people. It's professionally lit. There are commercials in between. It all appears, you know, they're never out of words. So it must be a news program. And a news program has true stuff in it. That's what news is. So anyway, I just thought that really, that sentence does so, the paragraph does so much work. And I thought it was great. And there's more, so I'll share the rest of them with you. It's worthless, of course. Reporters shout something at Trump about a thing he said. It continues to really fire on all cylinders here i'm sorry i'll just read it it's worthless of course reporters shout something at trump about a thing he said or did or response his response to someone else's response to something and then he shouts that he did it because he felt like it or actually didn't do it at all or that the criticism of what he did is offensive and illegitimate or that the question itself is if he's asked a question by a woman, he gets extra spicy. If he's wounded or inconvenienced, he'll sometimes take a few rapid lurching steps away and then look around with his lips pursed and his eyes cast up, which mostly makes him look like someone searching for a bathroom in a crowded airport terminal. If there's a purpose here, it's a big if, it's the theater of it. The theater of Trump's strange fey boorishness and the towering and obvious lies he tells which exist not to convince but more 
to signal his ongoing unwillingness to be constrained by fact. This is more or less what Trump has always thought the news should be like. People with microphones clamoring for his opinion and asking him about himself. For decades, the man has dreamed of reporters calling out, Please, sir, what's the latest on your personal feuds? Or, sir, how do you achieve this amazing success? While he delivers flirty, winking answers. That this is not the way it goes now that he's president clearly causes him great frustration. Watch these pissy helicopter-adjacent scrums and you may see a lumpy pink dope bellowing, we're looking into that very strongly in response to questions he can transparently not answer and dispensing whatever thudding speculative idiocy he thinks will get him to the next question. How often have we said that in poorer words, right? Other people will see what Trump sees. The important thing for him is that the microphones are still pointed in the right direction. The culture has been inching further and further into Trump's gilded funhouse for years now, and you surely do not need me to tell you that it effing sucks in there. I have to censor a little bit here. But we are, by now, all the way in. Trump is nearly as ubiquitous in the culture as he has always believed he should be. The one deeply held belief that has been evident throughout his whole faithless disgrace of a life is people should be talking about Donald Trump more on television. And he has just about seen that part through. All Trump wants, all he has ever wanted, is to be able to keep doing and taking and saying whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He ran for president for this reason and this reason only. His politics, to the extent they've ever been legible, have always been off-the-rack, big-city tabloid BS. Crudely racist, exterminate the brutes, back-the-blue authoritarianism in the background, and ruthless, petty, rich-person squabbling in the front. His actions since becoming president have been those of a dim, cruel child play-acting at being a powerful man giving orders without quite knowing what they mean or how they might be carried out, taunting enemies, beating up the people he can afford to beat up without having to be called to account for it, lying as needed or just for yucks. He hasn't changed a thing since graduating from punchline to president. It's been clear for decades that Trump was both an a-hole and a dummy. This is now a problem not just for the odd, unlucky cocktail waitress and his staff of cheesy apparatchiks, but for literally every person on earth. Presidents exert a kind of ambient influence on the culture, but as Trump is different than previous presidents, his influence necessarily feels different. Barack Obama wanted to be a cosmopolitan leader who brought people together and into a deeper empathy through a mastery of reason and rules. The country he governed doesn't work like that, though, and the tension between that cool vision and this seething reality grew and grew. By the end, his presidency had the feeling of a prestige television show in its fifth season, handsomely produced and reliably well-performed, but ultimately not really as sure what it was about as it first appeared to be. Trump has no such pretense or noble aspiration and has only made the country more like himself. Living in his America feels like being trapped in a garish casino that is filling with seawater because that's what it is. For someone who does it so frequently, Trump is not especially talented at lying. His dissimulations are all easy to see through. The things he heatedly accuses his enemies of doing are always things that he has done himself, is currently doing, or obviously aspires to do in the future. He is always desperate in the way that selfish and needy people are always desperate. His fears transparently run the show, both the normal human fear of failing and the more specific ones he picks up on the cable news channels he watches, 
which splits its uh, the channel really, of course, and we're talking about Fox here, which splits its broadcast day between fulsomely flattering coverage of him and armchair generalship in a sprawling race war. The network is imagineering out of rhetorical abstraction and into bloody existence. Watching hours of that every day would destabilize anyone. For Trump, who is very vain and very stupid and has always cared more about TV than anyone should, for him the result is equilibrium or entropy. It's so easy to see the shape of what Trump wants in the ways that he lies and lies about what is in the way he, he about what is in the way he gooses crowd numbers, in the way he tells stories about strong men weeping at his feet in gratitude for all he's done for this country, in the gap-intensive conspiracies and bizarre casual, uh, causal, sorry, causal helixes that he invents to explain away his failures. What's most striking about Trump's lies, beyond their overwhelming volume and bombast, is how they reflect his own monomania. So many are saying various things. And I love he's capitalizer. So many are saying. So many are saying various things that all somehow wind up being about him. They're saying it more and more because there is nothing else and no one else that he could imagine anyone wanting to talk about. The metastasizing they that opposes him grows by the day and cares about him every bit as much as he cares about himself. They will do, are always somewhere doing, whatever it takes to make him look like an idiot who Fs up and lies constantly. Nothing, certainly not the lives of any number of strangers or whatever is left of any national ideal, is more important than the survival of his most obvious throwaway fantasy. Everything returns to him, sometimes along a longer arc than others, but always in good time. His obliterating vanity can sometimes give this a darkly comic aspect, as when he was hilariously and transparently jealous of the few days of theatrical bipartisan mourning that followed John McCain's death. But it is generally too ghoulish to laugh at. Trump's engagement with the world is fundamentally an envious one. Other people possess what should be his. Everything that is not him is just getting in his way. This is why his response to the challenge of his office seems to top out at blustering and uncomprehending impatience. Those opiate deaths or wildfires or, and our fortnightly mass shootings are, here again capitalized, quite frankly so tragic. But it is palpable that the only real response Trump has to them is that they distract from what everyone had been talking about before, which was, and by right should, continue to be him. Trump and a lot of the people in his thrall are, it seems safe to say, gone. They will continue to walk among us. Trump will be in a golf cart. But they will never come back. They are somewhere else. There is nothing they are not prepared to believe if the right people say it. They will choose the right lie over any truth, not just without regret, but with pride. America loves to tell stories about itself to itself, and if these are not all quite lies, they are mostly much sweeter and safer than fact. The lies that Trump has told since his party lost badly in the midterm elections have ranged from the usual, the loss was actually a win, thank you to all into more explicit and desperate denial. It's not a new thing for Republicans to justify voter suppression and resist vote counting, but as Trump has subsumed his party, the importance of his particular fantasies, uh, I think we've missed a word here, subsumed, uh, where are we? Trump, uh, hmm, uh, did we read that wrong? But as Trump has subsumed his party to the importance of his particular fantasies, Trump still somehow does everything off the opening position that he has never been wrong or lost. The attendant need to make his lies true has grown and grown. He will lie if the truth doesn't fit and millions will hear that lie as a truth 
for that reason. Order will supersede law because it is easier that way. This is all open field. Anything that needs be can be labeled a fraud or the bought and paid for result of a conspiracy. And any fact can be made into something else afterwards. Trump won't stop. He won't stop because he's never told the truth in his life and because this is all he has and all he has ever had. He wakes up every day to the mess he's made and says and does whatever he must at whatever cost to get through the day. Like many in his generation, Trump has mistaken the end of his life for the end of the world. He can't imagine, let alone care about, what will be left after he is gone, if only because no one who matters to him will be around for it. His politics, such as they exist, boil down to this. He is trying to hold on, and will spend the rest of his life trying not to be found out. Every day is like this now. He could do this forever. He talks often about serving for longer than one more term, but that's mostly because... He has so much invested in never stopping. He is over leveraged as always. He can only ever do more. In the most basic sense, just in terms of getting off his ass to do the basic boring things that presidents do, Trump can't do the job. He can't care and he won't work and he never tells the truth, both because he doesn't know it and is afraid to know it. There is no reason to ask him or anyone who works for him questions. A half-truth isn't true enough, and even a half-lie is still a lie, and they will never do better than either. The work that needs doing, which Trump and his people cannot do or even see, is plain and urgent. It's all much bigger than him. And guess what? We've wrapped it up, and it's time for us to take a short one-minute break. We actually made it all the way through an article before a break. Brand new happening for us. Welcome back now to the Kicker on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio into our second hour and uh, anticipating our visit from Joan. And let's perhaps set things up with a couple of uh, stories about what's happening in Congress these days, because I don't know. We keep pretending that that's exactly what Joan wants to talk about. And I'm not even 100 percent sure it's what she writes about. That's true. And I know she writes about it with great passion. So I know she's enjoying that. I don't mean to limit the conversation to what's happening in, in Congress, although it is sometimes the best use of our time. Somebody who's as expert at what's happening day to day, minute to minute as Joan. So it's hard to resist, but well, you know, we'll leave the door open. Anything she wants to bring us, we're happy to have. Let's set it up this way. Uh, let's see. I've got a number of stories. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I think it would be a waste of Joan's time to talk about leadership contests, except in the most basic sense. But I, I want to take a minute. Any, well, pff, well, who am I kidding? I want to take some time to talk a little bit about uh, yesterday's episode, which I think can be viewed in any number of ways. But I'm talking about uh, the episode in which... Uh, well, still representative-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez joined with climate change-focused activists and protesters, joined in, uh, well, one, a press conference outside of the building, uh, which was joined by uh, at least one other of the newly elected representatives as well, but their action afterwards... <clears throat> which was to uh, head over to Nancy Pelosi's office, one of like 36 that she's got, and register their protest in generalized terms anyway, uh, but along with a an interesting set of relatively concrete demands about action on climate change, which included the establishment of a, a what how did they put it, the new green, new green, green new deal, what, I kind of, can't even recall exactly how the, the terminology goes. But in, in addition to fo a, a renewed focus on climate issues, a call for the establishment, or as it turns out, reestablishment of a committee inside the House to deal with this separately as an issue rather than dropping it into the middle of all the other environmental concerns. Uh, and uh, so it was. this was a, a really interesting exercise in seeing what you want to see 
out of this event because the, the protest goes forward. They protest briefly, relatively speaking, inside the speaker's office. And lo and behold, the speaker says, that's a great idea. We should definitely do that. Now, at this point, supporters of the speaker or, or you know, who, are, who consider themselves real partisans, I guess, on her behalf, and there's good reason to be such a thing, uh, so we're, we're quick to point out, well, you know, we actually did have that committee in 2007 after they won back the House in the 2006 elections. They established this committee and Republicans, when they took back the majority, abolished it. So this isn't even really a new thing, and and it isn't. But it, what I found so interesting was uh, it, it seemed like everyone was so invested in the fight, either from Ocasio's perspective or Pelosi's, that they missed the possibility that they both knew what they were talking about and found an opportunity to both put themselves on the same page and be proud of the results and it was very difficult, I thought, yesterday, at least on Twitter, where everything is difficult, to get people to swallow the idea that this might be a good thing and that this might even have been accomplished as between two very smart political women who knew what they were doing and that this was a great first step out of the box. And in the space of a single afternoon, two constituencies very often at one another's throat were offered press releases from both sides with glowing with praise for the other and their activity and their particular approach to this issue. And I, I am sorry we didn't take that opportunity, but maybe we still can. Uh, let's see what uh, that, um, perhaps that, among other things, might be on Joan's mind. Good morning, Joan. How are you today? Good morning. I'm fine. Of course I'm going to be here for for well, sure. leadership discussion. I, okay, excellent. <laughs> it's it's kind of more fun on the Republican side since it's fighting. Yes. But, <clears throat> no, I I do think that there was definitely an element of kabuki there. Yeah. Um, I don't think that there was any question that this is what Nancy Pelosi was going to do. But you know, it's nice for everybody yeah, to I have it was. this great press it worked out i even thought i'd say that but 50 50 odds that ocasio's folks phoned pelosi's office to say we're coming over and uh -huh. this is what we're doing yeah and you can meet us with that uh your ideas and uh you remember we i, I would imagine they've had some discussion at some point and they this committee idea had come up and said that would be a great idea in fact we act, we did such a thing well i think you could give it some more teeth this time sure Absolutely. So come on over and protest and I will respond appropriately. And and then what? I don't know. The fight's over. What are we going to do? So <laughs> everybody, everybody decided they were going to be upset about it from one side or another. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, instead we can say, uh, well, all right, here's the committee. Does anyone want to do any work? I, in that vein, I just shared with you a really great um, tweet series okay. from David Roberts tweet thread 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 uh -huh. the word is thread from David Roberts <laughs> at Vox the climate guy okay about ah. being smart oh well, well on this that. fight and it's it's really quite long but let's see if we can get to oh yes this uh, for, one. he starts with the background premise which I take to be crushingly obvious is that legislation out of the House isn't going to go anywhere. Yes, what you should remember that. Democrats are not going to be able to come up with the silver bullet plan that's going to solve this right. when there is a Republican Senate and Trump. So he says smartly that they need to take a three prong approach. Use control of the House committees to investigate, expose, and disrupt Trump's deregulatory efforts and mm -hmm. draw attention to neglected issues like climate. Double down on state efforts, um, which absolutely, we've got seven governor seats now and a trifecta in 14 yes. states. There's a great deal that can be done at the state level on climate. And uh, his last thing he says, develop a big, bold vision for federal action commensurate with the problem. And he says he puts this third intentionally. It's important for inspiring young voters, for orienting future organizing, but for defining the party. But mostly, 
as symbolism for the foreseeable future because it's going to be symbolism. So, yes. yeah, get this committee together, get your grand plan figured out, but don't expect Nancy Pelosi and the House of Representatives to save it. Yes. Because um, so they can't. Can do. Right. So be smart where you are putting your passionate efforts on yes. climate. And and there. this yes, <laughs> this is the problem. Is that some people see it as well, uh, it would only be smart to do this, whereas it could also be seen as smart to do that. And, There's uh, lots of smart yeah. things that can be done, and. Um, Screaming at House Democrats about it right now is probably not going to be the most productive use of time or energy. Unless you believe that they were never going to establish this committee, which turns out to be wrong. Yes. So, uh, yeah, although I'm, you know, I'm sure that caught a lot of people by surprise. After all, that committee was abolished while uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was still in her late teens. So, I mean, you know, I mean, she's a young person. That's that's what happens yeah. when you're young and then you like realize uh, as you get more time available to study what's gone on, you realize, oh, well, there are people I can work with here. So, OK. Yeah, I didn't see it necessarily as this big standoff, uh, but some people were invested in seeing it that way. And yeah. it's obvious. And, and I mean, I thought this was a great opportunity for. Well, for everybody, but a, a great demonstration of something Nancy Pelosi doesn't really get enough credit for, which is uh, because she's taking over again, probably as as speaker. Uh, it's these are timely stories like, well, what can she do? How will she make room for the uh, larger than life figures coming in on the crest of this blue wave, which they'll now admit is a wave because it means problems for Pelosi? Um and uh, the answer is uh, the same way she did it last time and based on the same principles, which is, yes, the new members are extremely important to the definition of the the, the, the uh, Democratic Party's image. And we'll do everything we can to include them in every way we can in significant leadership roles. This has been the hallmark of. Pelosi's leadership more so than any other, certainly any other Democratic leader and probably every other Republican leader in recent memory. Uh, and has always been the case. This is, that's that's how you lead coalition politics and succeed. And that should not, you know, come as a surprise, but more more than that, uh, more people should recognize it, I think. I think so, too. Um, I, I really think a lot of this threat to Pelosi is is kabuki i i yeah. i don't really well, think that there's any the huge groundswell of of people unhappy with nancy pelosi except for the sexists and there are an awful lot of them the big threat but you know yeah, comes from the from from the right of center of the democratic party there are unhappy people all over the place of course some of whom will even criticize Nancy Pelosi, but the ones who really are threatening to, you know, well, we're going to hold up the votes and make a problem on the House floor during the open vote. Those guys are the conservatives. Yeah. So, uh, you know, legitimate grievances on the left of the left, I guess. But, uh, yeah, they're not the ones threatening to upend the whole thing. They're just they're making demands about things we want done not throwing a tantrum about who's doing them. Absolutely. So I, I don't really think we're going to not have Nancy Pelosi. Um, unfortunately, I also don't think we're not going to have Steny Hoyer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. I, I could, I could do without Steny Hoyer in, in some ways, Clyburn too, hmm. in leadership. Oh, okay. Um, but but that's not how it's going to work, apparently. No. Um, All right. Well. And then, you know, if we want <laughs> talking about things that are kind of discouraging, Chuck Schumer has just been reelected to be Senate Minority Leader by yes, acclamation, like per yes. course, familiar as Frank Tharp with NBC. So. Yes, that sounds about right. I mean, we argue about uh, whether it's a, a great thing, but, uh, you know, again, you remember who votes in this it's 
the Democratic senators, they got what they wanted out of them last time and, and they're getting it again. And, and also there's some portion of this is uh, I just don't want any headaches right now. Uh, we're all still in the minority over here on the Senate side. I don't want to be the one on the floor dealing with uh, McConnell either. You know, whoever gets elected leader has, has to sit and meet with Mitch McConnell every day. There are no volunteers. <laughs> so that's how you get elected by acclamation. You keep doing it. You're the one that knows. <laughs> you, you deal with him. Right. Speaking of whom. Did you see his op-ed at Fox News? Uh, I saw the headline of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what prepared. I spent my morning, ah, first off, okay. dealing with our friend Mitch. Yeah. A lot of people have yeah. had great fun drawing parallels and making uh, you know analogies about what he had to say. It's, but I saw In somebody... case any of your <laughs> listeners missed it, yes. the title is, Will Dems Work With Us or Simply Put Partisan Politics Ahead of Country? Yeah. Yeah. Will we? Will we? I don't know. Uh, are we allowed to in the Senate? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. That's really kind of you know, Everybody here knows Mitch McConnell's yeah. greatest hits. Right. His, his single most important achievement is to keep Barack Obama, a one-term president. Right. Uh, his proudest moment was when I looked Barack Obama in the eye and I said, Mr. President, you will not fill the Supreme Court vacancy. Mm. Mitch McConnell shutting down the attempts of the Obama administration to inform the public that Russia was trying to interfere in the 2016 election. Yes. Yeah, and you can go back and you can look at Obama and say, yeah, maybe you should have pushed that one a little harder. Mm -hmm. But but that's Mitch McConnell now telling Democrats that they need to put <laughs> stop yes. putting politics ahead of the country. Right. Democrats sure need to show they can govern. I'm sure Maybe Putin is having a laugh at that one. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, so will we work with him? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might actually she try. just got reelected as, as yeah. a minority leader. <laughs> so I guess does that work? Does he, is, is, is McConnell happy with that? Does he not care one way or the other? I suppose he, there's grounds to believe he doesn't care who the minority leader is. Same thing's going to happen no matter what. He's going to roll over whever okay. it is. So, another, oh, that's a good point. I mean, given that they control the chamber and, and most of the rules and can manipulate the rules to their benefit whenever they need to, uh, maybe that's another way you get reelected as minority leader by acclamation. Whoever is there is going to get crushed, and everyone, all you know, Democrats are going to be pissed at them all the time. <laughs> the rank and file <laughs> Democrats, both inside the Senate and outside. Uh, so you do it. You're already yeah. hated. Keep it up. <laughs> Hell, if I'm going to tarnish my reputation there. I, I'd like to say it matters in the Senate, but it does in the sense that we could have much smarter fights. Yeah. More strategic fights. Mm. The ability to actually stop McConnell and Trump from rolling over is going to have to come from the House. Yeah. All right. So. Not much there. But uh, all right. Well, that is interesting. And I guess it gave us an opportunity to give people uh, a, a, a way that I hope they can deal with to uh, to process the reelection of Chuck Schumer as minority leader. <laughs> Um. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Wow. Well, all right. What so we have that. Yeah, yeah, you had a great conversation on the elections with with Greg. So I don't yeah. know that we necessarily have to revisit. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just seeing Jake Sherman from Politico tweeting that Pelosi expressing zero doubt that she will become speaker and Tim Ryan is saying he will not vote for Pelosi on the floor, period. And he believes that Democrats have enough votes to block her. Uh -huh. And yet there is no, <laughs> no alternative mm -hmm. candidate who stepped forward. So yeah, of course you could. Who, who's going to be the sacrificial lamb who says, sure, sure, Tim Ryan. It's not Tim Ryan who's stepping up to say. I'll be the alternative. Yeah. Well, it's I wonder who they're going to cast. Whatever alternative they come up with. They have to. Well, I guess they don't have to say 
anything. But uh, and, and it's one thing to to block her election. That doesn't necessarily mean it results in someone else becoming speaker. They would have to just uh, start their balloting over again and until they either gave up or or everybody came to the conclusion that there really was an alternative and that would be difficult to imagine. But uh, yeah, that's uh, all right. Well, uh, he can, he can vote for anybody he wants, literally anybody he wants. Ted Doesn't Yoho. have to be a member of the House of Representatives That's who is true. speaker. Uh, yeah, and if you're not serious, then that that opens up a number of possibilities. You vote for somebody that everybody says well, that's a good person, but I you know I don't want them to be speaker Oprah. of the House. Yeah, sure, right. You know, somebody, Although anybody, a black woman probably is. No, well, he might not choose that. Choice, that's true. Saying. Right, right. Wilford Brimley. <laughs> I'm feeling know. rather bitter about him right now. I, I can, can probably hear. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, I uh, my uh, view of this, of course, is there'll probably be a, a lot of discussion inside the caucus, not a whole lot, but some discussion by some people who are committed to having this discussion by virtue of what they discussed during their races uh, of alternatives but yeah, I mean the the caucus decision on who to nominate for the speakership is like a, a analogous to a primary. Hash it out, say what you think about new yeah. leadership or whatever, and then there's a general election happening on the floor. And I reiterate to all of the people who made it into office saying they weren't sure or they definitely weren't whatever going to support Pelosi for speaker. All those people won primaries and very often contested primaries and then, of course, insisted that all Democrats come together for the good of the country and stand behind them. And now that they've arrived in Congress, they're going to go through the same process for somebody else. And I don't think they're going to abandon that principle. I'm going to I think they're going to it's going to hit them that I just asked everybody in my district to do this. Yeah, and, and I'm going to have to do the same, although, you know, I said I was going to explore alternatives i did we couldn't find one now i'm make being asked you know are we going to embarrass ourselves or are we going to say look this is what we have for the moment and we're coming together to get some work done i hope they'll realize the same thing but uh okay tim ryan won't fine adam schiff had a really nice tweet on this yesterday that i just retweeted um saying in response to chuck todd because of course chuck todd quoting him saying he'll support Pelosi for speaker because this is the quote we need the strongest general that we have we need the best tactician we need the best organizer no one else honestly comes that close mm -hmm. so he retweeted that quote and then said it's my hope that President Trump will decide to work with Democrats and address challenges facing our country he has to say I that because so. you know he has to say that yeah, 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 but his hope. track record of doing so is poor make ah. that non-existent <laughs> Either way, we need the best legislator and tactician we have for speaker, and that is Nancy Pelosi, which yeah. is, you know, we have the Affordable Care Act, thanks to Nancy Pelosi. It's... She wasn't going to give up when yeah. they were ready to do so in the Senate. She mm -hmm. said no. Yeah. No. Well, it's uh, it, 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 it's indis indisputable, really, in terms of track record. There's just, there isn't anybody else that has that on the record. They can imagine themselves to be just as good, and maybe they really will be one day. They're just not yet. Nobody is. It's impossible. There's only been yeah. one speaker. Yeah. And, and you really don't want somebody who's getting on-the-job training when you're having to deal with Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. True also. Although I guess you could try to explain, oh, well, the rules, the old rules don't apply anyway, so what's the difference? I don't know them, but it helps <laughs> to know the old rules and know when they're being violated or or where the loopholes in the old rules are that you can use. It's very and well, and there's a lot a we would job. like her to be doing with those old rules, like yeah. recreating them uh -huh. for real, like pre-Gingrich um, Mm. Not likely to happen since she do, didn't do it last time around. Yeah, and, right. and possibly not the most important thing right now either. True. Um, given McConnell and Trump. Yeah. Two years from now, when we have the White House and the Senate back, hopefully, mm. then would be the time to uh, restructure, rethink 
how this whole thing works and try to get it back to some semblance of yes. how it was supposed to work, how it was right. envisioned to work. Put that the committees nice. back to work. Make individual yes. members have more power. Um, get back to committees. Get back to actual hearings and markups. Don't let the lobbyists write the legislation. Mm-hmm. All of these things. Yeah, all those would be would be helpful. Uh, and this time, 100-year-old Pat Leahy uh, will be told, no, the blue slips aren't coming back. <laughs> There's that, too. <laughs> I, I'm more interested in a lot of ways in how the House works than the Senate, because the Senate mm-hmm. is just such a pain in the neck. Yes, well, it's, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, yes. and this is much more fun. Okay. We've got the McCarthy Jordan leadership brawl oh, yeah. in which our friend Donald Trump is just having a good time meddling. He loves to meddle and he's so good at it from my perspective. <laughs> uh, in terms of screwing things uh, up? Yes, well, yeah, right. When he intervenes and uh, insists on a certain candidate coming out of the primary That candidate sometimes, well, they win the primary sometimes and then lose the seat, which is terrific. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, yes. You know, he's backing a horribly flawed candidate for a job he's not at all likely to. Well, at first he wanted him to be Jim Jordan. Oh, yeah. I back him for, uh, what he thought would be speaker, but that was stupid given, well, he couldn't foresee the loss for whatever reason. But now, I uh, guess what? He's fighting to get him on top of the Judiciary Committee. And you don't want Jim Jordan on top of anybody, for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he want, he's, he's now got hand-picked ideas for who he wants heading various committees. And... Well, he wants him as minority leader in yeah. the Senate. Well, that, that's, or Senate. Uh, no, House. House. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, word is that, for whatever reason, uh, McCarthy has that locked up. I mean, just inertia, really. But I can't believe yeah. they don't want to get rid of him. He's terrible. But OK, good, fine. You'll be saddled with a terrible leader. I don't mind that. And uh, but Trump is going to be pissed that there's this terrible leader because yeah. it's not Jim Jordan. Oh, and right. Of course, Jim Jordan is is in there frothing Trump up, saying right. he thinks that the the, they lost the House majority because they didn't go Trumpy enough. Right. I can get it back. They didn't get and... the border wall. They didn't repeal Obamacare. Right. And so, of course, Trump's going to love that. Sure. And 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 he'll believe that uh, that changing Republican leadership would result in getting those things, even though they'll be in the minority. Which, if he understood politics, and it's clear that he does not, he would know. At least limit your expectations. Yeah. But no. So I'm I'm glad they're I, fighting. I love how political Politico though tries tries to play this. That yeah. Trump is jumping into the fray to play peacemaker. Because <laughs> that's his favorite game. <laughs> play peacemaker. Uh yeah. He's he's there just to try to get McCarthy to strike a deal with with the Freedom Caucus. Mm, oh, okay. So, <laughs> and yes, that would put him at the the House, the top Republican and Judiciary Committee. Which, yeah, is he writing love letters to anybody and falling in love with them? <laughs> yeah, is that how he'll be a peacemaker? Idea. How he's actually trying to be peacemaker here, but I don't think that that's necessarily how Jim Jordan is interpreting this. Uh, Jim Jordan doesn't want to be. The top oh. de- Republican on judiciary. Maybe he does. Maybe he no? does. What he huh. wants to be is, is minority leader. Huh. Yeah. I mean, he'd rather do that, I'm sure. But I mean, well, I, I assume he'd accept the job. Does it? I'm sure he think would. that it's of adequate compensation for him. I don't know what he thinks he's being paid back for, but. <sighs> Mm, all right. Well, uh, Trump wants him there apparently because he thinks so. that he would be the best person to derail investigations. Oh, he is good at that. Yeah, that's his specialty. That. That's true. Uh, a terrible crime has been committed, and you don't want anybody to look at it. 
Jim Jordan may Jim be Jordan your guy. guy. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so uh, good choice in that sense, I suppose. All right, we'll take a brief break, reorganize, uh, decide on what else deserves priority, and be right back uh, in your face in two minutes, if you'll let us. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kago in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the k Grow in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Joan is still with us. We're pondering the various uh, things that we can bring to you. And uh, as we said before the break, uh, we don't want to force anything on you. We're, we're all cooperating here. So trying to figure out stories that are uh, worth putting on the radar. Uh, it is the case that the, the uh, Congress is back in session, not just uh, meeting to reorganize themselves and have their leadership fights, which they do need to do uh, before starting the next Congress. But the, I guess the lame duck session is underway as well. Not, well, yes, yes. I mean, they haven't really shown up on the floor to start doing stuff mm. quite yet, which, hey, guess what's coming? Mm. <laughs> December 9th. Yeah. Oh. Government funding oh. deadline. Why did we do that? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe it. All right. Well, okay. So we have to – what's standing in the way of it now? Do we, is it just that we had a, a CR that's expiring? CR that is, is okay. expiring. Some of the funding has been done um, kind of remarkably, but I hmm. think probably because they knew there would be the border wall fight. Ah, yeah. This was they, – they had to keep putting Trump off. So they they were trying to get as much off of their plates as they could before they had to have this big fight after the midterms. Mm -hmm. So there's there's some good chunks of it that are done. Um, DHS funding and the wall are among the things that aren't done. Yes. Okay. And right now, Trump is in enough of a tantrum about the midterms that um, we could definitely have a government shutdown over border wall funding in mm. a couple of weeks time. Okay. Yeah, and uh of course the the big big wins in the tremendously successful elections for Republicans will convince Donald Trump that uh, the nation is clamoring for his wall. I am sure he believes that had Republicans actually repealed Obamacare and built the wall, they would have won. I'm positive he thinks yeah, that. Yeah, he probably does. Uh, but he's he's forced to say that they won anyway. So yes. uh, I don't know exactly where he uh, – who cares how he spins it. He'll be demanding the wall, I, and I assume maybe that's how he brings the caravan back the one we forgot about since last we 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 know what's going on but uh yeah lots of uh lots of coverage the, of yeah the caravan is 2018's ebola yeah or the uh the killer bees of the 70s right so they never do they ever get here i don't know they must have taken a so. turn somewhere yeah, yeah. Oh, okay because i mean uh, my recollection being a, a young kid at the time was a they were supposed to come up and, of course, everybody was supposed to be dead in their wake, but they were going to fly straight up all the way to Maine and kill everybody. <laughs> but maybe I misunderstood the danger. I think you misunderstood the danger. Okay. I well, don't think that they were quite, quite as as deadly as uh -huh. their name would attest. Yes. Well, but there are some of them around. Okay. So. 
But they're all right. So they're real, and they they just stayed down in the hot south. I thought they were gonna roll straight over into the Arctic and then come down on top of Asia and just wipe out everything. It could still happen. Oh. In fact, it's probably more likely to happen now that the ice is melting. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. The real danger all along uh, wasn't the warming of uh, the Earth itself. It was that it was going to make it safe for the killer bees to, the killer to bees. relocate. <laughs> the upwardly mobile killer bees that are going to <laughs> move to urban centers and work at the Amazon headquarters, I guess. I don't know. Uh, what else? Uh, let's see. So uh, there's gonna, that's not <laughs> so really happening. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw that story in there, too. Um, so, yeah, Trump's in a bad mood. Yes. We've got oh, government yeah. funding coming up. We've got still – we have the ongoing problem of the budget bill that's sitting there that the House Budget Committee approved, but the full House didn't, that mm-hmm. has the reconciliation instructions oh. that would get Medicare and Medicaid. Um. Okay. And we still have Paul Ryan in control for another month, and we still have Mitch McConnell oh, saying we've got to deal with deficit. So, <laughs> so we can't be completely sanguine about Democrats' wins in the election last week for the time that Paul Ryan is still in control of the House. Oh, is that I the way we say it? Think- he's going to be able to do anything to destroy Medicare and Medicaid because I think there are probably going to be enough Republicans left and enough in the Senate who say, um, Mm. (laughs) did you just see what happened? Maybe we don't want to set ourselves up two years from now. Yes. Right. But it's still there. Just, just that little thing is still there as is of course Mm. the need to fund the rest of government. Okay. And a open attorney general position with a Trump crazy person acting in it right now. Yes. Uh, right. I don't acknowledge his, his existence, <laughs> really. But, uh, yeah, I, we're all. It uh, doesn't work that way, can't grow. No. Well, uh, maybe we can work it that way. I, I don't know why we've all acquiesced to to this, to referring to him as the acting attorney general, just because that's what he says he is. But, yeah. Well, th- that'll be settled in court, uh, or well, I don't know how soon, but the beginning on the uh, question of whether or not this guy was is really who he says he is, essentially. Uh, now that we have to name him in suits, you know, everybody who has to go forward by suing the attorney general needs to know: is this person really it? I need yeah. to get the name right on the cover. Basic question. So it's a very basic question, and of course, do do we want to bring up the scary possibility? We might as well. I mean, like we said, it's not going to be news to Republicans who could do something about it. But yeah, uh, why, there's going to be ahead. a recess. Yes, there yeah. has to be because we're switching to a new Congress. Right. Even so if, they can't if it's just seconds. adjourn, they actually have to have an actual recess in which Trump could appoint people. Yes. This is historically possible. And even if you engineer things so that the recess is really a merely a, a, literally one second long, that's all it takes. And it's one of the few uh, uh Places where the Supreme Court, according to their their latest rulings, still recognize uh, recess appointments, even though it's probably the most ridiculous of yeah. all of the recess appointment spaces that have ever been recognized. But uh, we have this weird historical anomaly where in the past presidents have said, yeah, the, the literal one second break between the hundred and what are we in 15th Congress and the 116th Congress is a recess, and I therefore you could just drop Whitaker in there and say, "All right, well, I changed my mind. He's not a temporary replacement. He's a permanent replacement, or at least as permanent as a a uh, recess appointment can be, which is would be the rest of his term anyway." Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess it's possible. 
It's possible. And he's horrible. Probably not likely, but it's Trump. Yeah. Uh, and he may just do it just to, you know, one of those own the libs moves. It's so ridiculous and the sort of thing that would set any Republican off in a, you know, in a rage were a Democrat to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's reason enough to do it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. It, I don't care whether it did, in fact, set them off on a yeah. rage. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right, so I guess there's there's that uh, possibility that he may decide that the, this guy is so horrible and offensive. And oh, well, I can... Trump's not going to decide that it's, he's so horrible and offensive. Senate Republicans are, and they're probably not. Even even if Lindsey Graham ends up taking over the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is still a possibility, hmm. he probably would not get through. All right. Maybe he would. Jeff Flake's not going to be there anymore to right. be Jeff Flake. So. Well, we do have Mitt Romney. He'll be there to be Jeff Flake. <laughs> to be Jeff Flake. I saw a picture of, of Mitt and Susan Collins happily chatting on the escalator, <laughs> and it almost made my head explode this well, morning. <laughs> I'm deeply concerned. Deeply concerned. <laughs> by that. Yeah, she is too, which is really strange. <laughs> I don't know why she's so concerned, but I think that's just what she says about everything. So it's her favorite, favorite, favorite word. Yeah. It's That's her true. also like from Sarah Palin. She, she said also, also and Sarah, and Susan Collins says, I'm deeply concerned. <laughs> yeah, I, ma'am, the Susan question Collins was whether you wanted fries deeply with that. concerned, by the way, because we are not going to forget Susan Collins role in the last two years. Yeah, so just, right. just saying. Well, yeah. Work for you, Susan. Right. And I think she knows it and she's deeply retiring probably when the time comes <laughs> probably so, good fine that's okay and uh just in time i guess uh, why why go through the trauma you go ahead and announce your retirement enjoy yourself take it off take it easy get lost uh and you know there, after that there's really nothing we could do to you so that's your best option quite honestly i think the best thing about last tuesday was how excited it's made me for 2020 yeah good uh, not that anyone will let you wait for 2020. I no. I am not certain why. Uh, there are some people who are very invested in making a new candidate happen, and I can't figure it out. But uh, yeah, well, not I don't know necessarily. I'm not really excited about the presidential for 2020 because oh. I hate presidential elections yeah. always. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm with you but, there. I but guess. for the Senate fight, yeah. I am totally Good. there for that. All right. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I just, uh, I, I think those primaries, I hate that. They're awful. Yeah, it's very, yeah. Some people love them and they're good I am for invested us, enough but... in it to say Iowa and New Hampshire have to mm. go as the first. <laughs> Absolutely, positively, we cannot do that again. I have a feeling we might. Yeah, so, I know. So I don't want to disappoint you there. To us. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. That is, that's problematic. I do hate the primaries. They're good for you, you know, medicine and all that and working, hashing out issues. But boy, do I dislike having to watch people who are, you know, good people get dismantled and it bothers me uh, that we don't have any better way of, of doing that. You know, they recover in the end and they, they work out just fine. And very often their stature in the Senate or wherever they're serving is lifted by having participated in all this. It's just rough. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Rough work occasionally has to be done. Uh, anything else we need to, uh, alert folks to here or, uh, other things that you see coming or. Uh, well, we were promised sort mm -hmm. of halfway indictments yesterday. Oh yeah. But it didn't happen. Right. So nobody promised, you know, nobody's guessed. talking about whether those cameras are still outside the courtroom. So I don't mm. know. Friday seems like the day they do these things. Though. It does. So it maybe does. then, which would, uh, you know, it would fit the pattern. It would make it difficult to cover. And probably, will, you, you know how they uh, they love to uh, wait for my show to be over. <laughs> to do the indictments. I think they that's what they're waiting for. And, it's all um, about you, Kagro. Yeah, everybody, you know, is concerned about what am I going to say to 
<laughs> to our listeners, uh, that's not it. But Friday, uh, they tend to do, and they tend to do these things uh, somewhere between ten and eleven in the morning. Sometimes we miss it entirely. Sometimes it just disrupts what's happening. Oh, it's fine. I'll wait for Friday. But uh, yeah, I don't know whether we were uh, correctly advised, I guess, in thinking that they were going to come so quickly. But uh, I do feel like there might be some pressure to move f so for as long as the Whitaker, the alleged appointment is is fluid. And yes. uh, they may want to get some of this stuff done before he gets his feet beneath him and can begin interfering in ways that can really affect things. Yeah. So we'll see. And uh, <clears throat> I guess if they're pausing... I wonder if that means anything. Mueller is pretty savvy. I mean, he may just, it may be that they're just not ready, or it may be that he just says, you know, this Whitaker guy is a non-factor. I know how this is going to work out, which would be f nice, fun, but I I, I, I think I we can trust that Mueller is very, very smart and has figured out some of how, the, how this is going to go. I mean, he, he's looking ahead to know where the pitfalls are. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I just want it done. Yes. Well, uh, it would be great. But uh, I, I also feel like I've been through this a lot before. And uh, we just, this country, we just tend not to bring the hammer down on our politicians. Yeah. For the good of the country. And it sucks and it gets worse for the country every single time. But that's the that's our favorite excuse. Maybe that's just another one of those stories. Stories we tell about ourselves, as we were mentioning. In the we are a forward-looking nation rather right. than a backward-looking nation. Oh, yes. See? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've been through that one before. We have. And look where it got us. Yeah. Not but... that I'm bitter or anything. <laughs> well, you know, uh, all you can do is be right. And uh, I guess you could be right and win power and then apply it. But uh, we haven't done that work. So, no, uh, not yet. Yeah. All not right. Yet. I don't know. We, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> don't, I want to get off of that subject as quickly as possible, <laughs> I think. Because we were being optimistic about 2020. So yeah. let's continue to be right. optimistic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. All right. So, uh, I mean, we want to, want to add to, to that. I mean, I know you're excited about the possibility of, uh, or the way the the next congressional elections come out, and uh, presumably this having been the worst map ever in the Senate, yeah. the next one is got to be better. It's got to be better. It is better. There are. Let's see. Just had it up. Senate map twenty twenty, hmm. and it's not. You know, it's not a slam dunk for us. There but... never is. Let's see here. Let's see. Pull up that that handy map in the roll call story. It's not too early to start looking at the 2020 Senate map. Okay. We have got Cory Gardner, who uh, ah. he's up for re-election in 2020, and he can't be very happy about that. Looking at how Colorado's been going. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's going to be an Arizona seat. Um, Ah, yeah, special right. election for the final two years of McCain's term. Um, I would not be at all surprised to have McSally in that seat. Right. I think probably her consolation prize is going to be being named for McCain's seat that John Kyle is now sitting in. I don't think he wants to stick around. Hmm. Maybe. Um, I'm sure they figured that one out. And I think it probably has something to do with McSally's being a good girl through this whole long vote counting process. Yes, I think you're right. You she to... just, she was very pleasant about it. I mean, she's not known for being a nice person. I have never heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess not. Uh but yeah, she so had the she opportunity. Was quite nice through all of this, quite gracious. Right, right. Was very gracious in her concession speech. Mm hmm. Sitting on her couch with her dog. Right. All of that would um, 
entitle her to the the mantle of McCain. Yes. In the view of, you know, mainstream Republicans, I guess. Uh, so expect her to be there. Expect okay. her to be the one running. In, All right. In two years. Yeah. Um, and we're not. There's there's a slight question mark on Mississippi right now. Yes. Which is I keep forgetting about, but it, yeah. it's true. Yeah, there's going to be a runoff. Yeah, uh, so I like that. In 13 days. Wow. Boy, you never get a break. We we it happens everywhere, but uh, we 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 have a special election now to replace Jennifer Wexton here, and I, the primary is this Saturday. <laughs> Like, oh Lord! <laughs> come on, and and we may replace her with a uh, a state delegate, which will only trigger another special, special election, election immediately after, and then we oh. have off year elections <laughs> in in Virginia for for state legislature. So I'm not uh, pleased about the season never ending, but uh, all right. Well, but suck still. it up, Cagro. This yeah. is a democracy, right? I know. I have to keep voting and doing my civic yeah. duty. Make your kid vote. Yeah. That's going to be really difficult. Again? Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. I... Again? And it's Saturday, which we keep saying, oh, let's have elections on Saturdays or make it a holiday. And, and now it'll be a Saturday. And our, our new 18-year-old voter will be like, are you joking? I have to do this on a Saturday? It was fun when I was on a Tuesday. School was closed. <laughs> this sucks. And it does suck. Yeah. It does suck. Let me see. I saw the priorities for 2020 Senate seats from um, DS, I Mm -hmm. think. And now I'm looking for them and can't find them. They were ranking which prioritizing the seats because there are so many. Okay. Oh, it's from Priorities USA Chair Guy Cecil. The six core swing states for 2020. Guess what the first one is? Oh, no. What? Florida. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Let's, you know what we Although should... it doesn't have a Senate seat. Okay. But That's we're going to be back in Florida. We've got um, well, then how... Wisconsin. Also not going to have a Senate seat. None of the swings are going to be apparently... I'm looking at the wrong well, yeah, thing. What, what, what we list have is this? North Carolina, <laughs> Arizona, Georgia okay. for expansion, and they will all have they will all have center races. All right. Um, as will Iowa and yeah. Minnesota. We're going to be okay, okay there, I believe. Virginia. Yes. Colorado. That's mm-hmm. what is going to be tough, and uh, Texas again. No. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Which which you have to think what's Beto going to do? Yeah, I'm not sure how to read that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, certainly there will be fans who say, "Yeah, let's carry the momentum forward," and then there'll be others who say, "But you lost. But mm-hmm. it was close." And it's closer mm-hmm. than it ever has been. Yeah, but it didn't. Uh, and, you know. and against Ted Cruz, who's but it's also oh, yes. going to be a presidential year. And right. uh, well, well, I don't know. But we have to leave it to Texans. They will figure this. We out. have to leave it to Texans and Debato, who, um, if he's going to keep his powder dry, we have to ask what for. So yes, that's true. Yeah, I mean the alternative is. Uh, just leave forever? No, that can't be either. No, no. So, we don't want him to leave forever. Yeah, so, I mean, what else do you do? So, okay. Keeping and that it would in be mind. really good to get rid of John Cornyn. It would have been sure. better to get rid of Ted Cruz, but Cornyn yes. would be a fine, fine one to say goodbye to. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I'd happy to take either one of them out. It would be great. And, uh, yeah, I mean, in some ways, I guess I would even prefer to see him, to see Beto run for Senate again. I, I am sometimes disturbed when I see people just saying, well, whatever you got uh, that's open, I'll run for that. You know, if you mm-hmm. have a vision of what you want to do in the Senate, good. I expect to see you back here again, as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, oh, I could be governor. That or, close when, yeah. you, when you're that close. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, it wasn't like his race was all about, well, I'm here to get rid of Ted Cruz. It was, you know, he, Ted Cruz is the guy currently occupying the seat and doing a bad job. I want to go and do a good job. Uh, luckily, sort of, in a way, Ted, uh, Ted Cruz isn't the only senator we have who's doing a bad job. <laughs> There's another one. John Cornyn is also terrible. He's not as he's loathsome. He's just but, stupid. You know what? Maybe he is just as loathsome. I don't know. I don't feel any... Real... I think he's as... Well... Mm. He's he's differently loathsome. I don't think he's the Zodiac loathsome. killer. Loathsome. It's really hard for anybody to reach loathsome levels of yeah. Cruz. He's, other than Cruz. Yeah. He's a manipulative liar and uh, and, and horrible on, on the issues. But again... I don't think he's the Zodiac killer. So, oh, I do. Oh, I mean, Cornyn. You think Cornyn oh, is? Cornyn. <laughs> no, no. That's no. it. What Maybe a brilliant like disguise. Can you imagine? <laughs> he's been the Zodiac killer the whole time. And he's the one <laughs> spreading rumors about Cruz to throw us off the scent. This is fantastic. <laughs> Only thing that could be better is if Scoob and the gang pull his mask off and it's Ted Cruz underneath John Cornyn. Oh, wouldn't that be perfect? It would be. Although it would make me wonder what's underneath Ted Cruz. <laughs> The other the Zodiac, Zodiac killer. killer. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, well, all right. So we're willing to slug it out with those guys. Uh, do you, do the list, did you find the list you were looking for then, the priorities uh, yeah, among so Senate like, races? Can okay. we just go through them kind of? Yeah, and then send that yeah. off to me. I can give it over to people. Oh. What else is on the list? Oh. Um, now I have to go find it again. Oh, okay. Well, I clicked off of it. I'm oh. sorry. Yeah. These things. Those happen. priorities. Is that, uh, well, we can always I'm take care of it looking. afterwards. Okay. No pressure. Just, <laughs> just the clock and all ticking. <laughs> okay. Here, the let clock me show doesn't care if you can't you. find it. Yes. I am putting it in our DMs. Okay. Excellent. It's should be sliding in now let's see yes so let's look at it again okay okay so we've got our swing states yeah florida wisconsin pennsylvania michigan new hampshire and nevada which not all of them have senate races okay so but i think they're good ones to look at presidentially right um Next tier of expansion states I like. North Carolina, Arizona, Georgia. Mm, okay. Yes. I I think those are good. Those are good. We've particularly gone. North Carolina. Um yeah. which does have a Senate race. Okay. And we've proven something in Arizona and Georgia. Yes, we have. And then I don't know about Ohio. Mm. Minnesota, Virginia being their third tier of watch states. Yeah, what do they mean by I? I, I putting I them as the third tier is slightly concerning. Yeah, well, and as a watch state, I don't know. I, I don't feel like we do. We, I mean, I'm not I, gonna I would stop like to have that. Ohio particularly moved up, given yeah. how Ohio is kind of important. Oh. In the presidential, um, maybe they filled. Maybe they're giving it up. I, I hope they're not giving it up. Uh, I, I'm confused by the list, but we'll perhaps maybe we'll uh, we'll share with everybody and uh, we'll ask everybody come back tomorrow. Uh, it's your homework assignment. Figure out what this <laughs> list means. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Weird. All right. Well, we got to wrap things up here uh, at any rate. So as uh, there's your assignment for tomorrow, figure there, that but... one out. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, not everything that we bring uh, from the outside adds clarity, uh, but, but we always do. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> right. Thank you, Joan, for coming by. I will, will say that we, we added all the clarity we could given the materials we had to work. Blame others for this. <laughs> if I've learned anything from Donald Trump and I have not. But if I had, it would it be would th that. this. Right. Lie uh, your way out of everything. But I, I hope that that ends badly for him and it becomes a bad example. Thank you, Joan. We had an extended session with you today. This was great. Thank you for coming in and for coming in early at that. 
Thank you are you. most welcome. We'll have some clarity for you on the uh, list by next week, I think. And we'll talk to you again then. Okay. Okay. Very good. We'll be getting ready for Thanksgiving. Oh, yes, that's right. What am I saying? I will be doing the same, probably. So we probably won't even do that. However, we will Keep think about one I'll be here if you need me. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Joan. And in that case, enjoy your Thanksgiving. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. All right, everybody. Uh, stay tuned now, please. Uh, I don't even have to beg you for this anymore. But Justice Putnam and the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up next. Let's see what we can get in here with today. Mississippi Governor hmm, answered questions about Senator Hyde Smith's racism. From Daily Coos Radio. With a racist answer. Radio.com. You have been listening to the K Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Yeah, not good hiding the races in Mississippi. Uh, not particularly good at that. How about this one now? California Utility Pacific Gas and Electric emailed a homeowner about sparking lines one day, one day before the campfire started in the same area. Hmm, gee, I wonder if that has anything to do with that. And much, much more, of course, coming up next on the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy.